Welcome to Backroom Talk. So my name is Tom Soroka. And everyone just loved Tom because he was an unbelievable athlete. This guy would just go and touch and go, clean and jerk 315 to win matches. I have yet to see an athlete be a very successful athlete and coach simultaneously. It's just not physically possible. I think CrossFit did a great job. They put more barbells in the general population's hands than any sort of training modality ever could imagine. To listen to more Backroom Talk, be sure to subscribe. Learn to design personalized programs with the OPEX system of coaching by heading to opexfit.com. Could you just introduce yourself a little bit and uh, sure. tell the sure. tell the listeners and watchers who you are? Yeah, so my name is Tom Soroka. Um, I live I live in Elmhurst, Illinois, which is a suburb right outside Chicago. Uh, I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. Um, uh, did football track in high school. Uh, went to college uh, as a shot putter. Um, I was a three-time All-American at Aurora University in the shot. Uh, after college, I got into uh, the Highland Games. That was my main thing that I did, which is those are the guys that wear the uh, kilts and flip telephone poles and stuff along the, those lines. Um, and then I got recruited to join Glenn Penley as a weightlifter when he was out of California Strengths. So I did that. I was there out in California for six months. Um, while I was doing the Highland Game stuff, I was a teacher. I was a grade school PE teacher. Uh, I was a throws coach at a local college, and I was doing some personal training and stuff on the side. And then Glenn gave me a phone call, asked if I wanted to come out. I was out there for a week, thought I was just learning how to do snatch clean and jerk. Little did I know it was actually a recruiting trip. And, uh, you know, he brought me out there. Uh, I kind of quit everything that I was doing here in Illinois, moved out to California. I was out there for six months. And then the team split and went to um, Fort Mill, South Carolina, which is right outside Charlotte, where they had MDUSA or Muscle Driver USA. So I was there from 2012, I was there from June 2012 till June 2016, I believe. Yeah, June 2016, and I moved back up here to Chicago. Uh, during that time, I, I was uh, I competed in Olympic style weightlifting. Um, uh, uh, trying to come, the goal was to make the 2020 team, but then, um, you know, obviously it didn't work out. Uh, I ended up getting injured, uh, leading up to 2016 and then ended up just kind of, uh, seeing my way out, um, on there. My best lifts, uh, when I was doing the Olympic style weightlifting was 202 in the clean or 152 in the snatch, which is 335 pounds. Uh, and then 202 in the clean and jerk, which is 444 pounds. Um, like the highest I ever got was I was an alternate for the Pan American team, uh, in 2014, uh, because I won the American open, uh, in the one Oh five plus category in 2013. Um, after that, uh, I got involved in uh, grid. Um, the guys were putting together uh, a team in Charlotte originally. Uh, that was kind of my introduction to like CrossFit. Like I was coaching weightlifting classes at CrossFit, had no intentions on dealing with that at all. And then uh, the guys, uh, 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 Ken Crowder, uh, were there putting together a pro team for Charlotte, had a couple of tryouts, grabbed a couple of people that they thought would be interested, got me involved in it. I started to learn a little bit about it. Uh, it was super fun. It was so, it just reminded me of kind of like high school sports, a little bit like the team aspect of it. Um, and then they told me about the SAGL, which Carl was a, a, a part of at that time. And so I was involved in the inaugural uh, uh, SAGL season. Um, I was with, shoot, uh, I don't remember where they were located out of. They're brown. We had these ugly brown, orangish um, jerseys. And I'm drawing a blank on the name right now. But was it, it wasn't Bluffton, right? No, Bluffton was who we, w w we switched to. Uh, or no, what though? That was the Bruisers. Um, we switched to Port Royal Sound. DC was our like affiliate. Our DC was like our, our mate, our pro team or whatever, but like, I, I couldn't, I, I have the jer Marauders, Charleston. Yes. Yes. Charleston. Yeah. Uh, Barry Pepper was our coach. And then, uh, um, I enjoyed it a ton. I had never done half the stuff that was there. Didn't realize there was a pro league and stuff like that. So, uh, I kind of, I, uh, right after that season, I moved back to Chicago, uh, opened up a CrossFit, Big Shoulders CrossFit. I owned that for a year, um, and I trained solely for Grid to try and get drafted by a uh, pro team. So then I was flying back and forth because I had a bunch of uh, uh, Southwest miles accumulated from other stuff, and I was going back and forth for the second season. They switched the team, and we were the Port Royal Sound Gunners. 
uh, and I did the second season of the SAGL. I ended up getting drafted by the New York Rhinos. Um, but I was Wes Kitts' backup, which I'm pretty sure that's, that's a cool person to be a backup to. Uh, so they didn't have much uh, need for me with West Kitts on the team. So um, I didn't I didn't go to Salt Lake to do a lot of the the the, the matches and things like that. Um, and then after that, I sold the CrossFit because I started coaching weightlifters when I opened the CrossFit. So I was under the impression that we needed a CrossFit to build a weightlifting program in the Chicagoland area. Um, and after about a year of running the CrossFit and the weightlifting team and starting to do sports performance. I just realized that wasn't necessary. So I sold the CrossFit and just solely focused on weightlifting, Olympic style weightlifting and sports performance. Um, and so I was in a small little shoebox of a space in uh, for, for three years. And then last November, uh, we moved into the space that we're currently in. Um, so we train uh, Olympic weightlifting. Our youngest lifters are 10, 11 years old. Our oldest lifters are in their 60s. Uh, we do sports performance training for middle school, high school, college age kids. Um, and then I myself, I got back into the Highland Games, so I'm on the pro circuit for the Highland Games now. And then uh, the other thing that I do um, is a sport called Moss Wrestling, and I've been on uh, three world teams for that. And it's essentially like you're trying to wrestle a stick out of some dude's hand before he does it to you. Uh, it's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much where that brings us up to here. Um, I've, I've kind of dabbled in all the strength sports. I like being able to do all these different things and say I've done all these different things and it's kind of helped me as a coach kind of relate to athletes of all walks of life and teach them how to transfer in and stuff like that. And then um, on top of that, uh, I'm also a, now a strength coach at a high school. I, I when I came back, I started teaching again. Uh, and then two years, this is my second year at the school. I got asked if I wanted to take over a strength and conditioning program for a school in the Chicago public school system. So I did that and that's what I'm doing. Uh, that's my day job. And then the gym is kind of like my passion project hobby that I run in the evenings. Yeah, man, we were, we were uh, George and I were looking looking at some of your uh, Moss wrestling videos yesterday. I was trying to explain the sport to her. She's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. It, it's a very old sport, but like popularity wise, it hasn't, we haven't done much. Uh, or they, or they, they, they haven't ever, they're trying to get it into the Olympics. Um, but with them cutting a lot of these traditional sports and things like that in favor of stuff that is going to draw more of a crowd, I don't see it getting into the Olympics. Um, but that's a, another conversation for another time, but it's, it's fun. Uh, I like it simply from the individual. Like I just, I gravitate more towards individual stuff. Um, like I like being on teams and things like that, but I always hated the aspect of like, I could try as hard as I can and we'd still lose because somebody else didn't do great. Like that never just sat well with me. So I like the aspect of Moss. Like I like the combat aspect of it. Like it's just you and that other dude. And if he beats you, he's better than you. And if you beat him, you're better than him. So I just, I, I just like that kind of stuff in terms of competition. How, how did, how did you find that, man? A hundred percent by accident. I showed up to an event that Ode Haugen was putting on in Chicago. Uh, I signed up for a strongman contest, and strongman was on one day. Moss wrestling was on the other day. I showed up on the Moss wrestling day, um, and miss the strongman contest altogether and they're like well you're here like you can do this you know this if you want and I'm like yeah sure whatever cool um and so I did it it was like an open tournament so they just kind of open tournament they put everybody in one um like bracket and you just kind of do round robin style and stuff like that and I ended up taking second to a very large very powerful gentleman named Euless Payne um, and then I never thought about it again. And then like a month and a half later, Ode Haugen called me, asked if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to compete on, uh, in the world cup that year, which was in Hungary. So uh, my second ever competition was at, it was in Hungary, which was pretty cool experience in and of itself, just getting to travel and talk to the different, uh, uh athletes from other countries and stuff like that. Can you just talk us through like what mass wrestling actually is because I'm sure there are some people listening that haven't seen it before I know <laughs> yesterday was my first day seeing it and like what are the characteristics that make a great mass wrestler so essentially what it is is you've got a, a board that sits in the middle of the two of you um, you and this other person that you're going up against, you sit on the ground and both you put your feet on opposite sides of the board. Uh, the judge places a stick in between the two of you. One of you grabs it, sets your grip. You either take inside, outside grip, depending on who got to go first. Um, and then the other person takes their grip. Uh, you try to, you kind of take your strain to kind of get yourself set. And the judge makes sure that the stick starts center of the board. 
And when it's center, he lets go. And you've either got to try to pull the individual onto your side or pull the stick out of their hand. And you can walk up and down the board. The board's anchored to the ground. Um, so you can walk up to the side of it or you can just try to use brute force. The best way to describe it is doing a deficit deadlift from a four inch block while somebody is on the other side of that four inch block trying to do a deficit deadlift as well. <laughs> Dude, that's perfect. I was looking for like a stick in this room so we could show the people. Georgia and I could go like here and then I would just rip Georgia over me <laughs> right I through the door. You <laughs> and then it's cool. It's a weight class sport. So they got weight classes that go all the way down to like 50 kilos, about 110 pounds up to the super heavyweights, which like I said, like Euless Payne, probably one of the top three to five guys in the world. Um, and I'm pretty sure he's well over like 350 pounds. He is a gigantic human being. Um, and so it's just, it's just, it's just kind of cool. Like there's different techniques and different styles based on the weight class and stuff. Like, so I compete in a 275 pound weight class. So those are all the guys that are a little bit more athletic, but like they want to be like world's strongest man competitors, but they're just a hair too small to be world's strongest man competitor. So it's the, the 275 is a fun class for me. Um, a lot of old like Olympic weightlifters, a lot of shot putters, stuff like that, that they come from various backgrounds. So it's kind of cool when we're all at these competitions, kind of talk about, you know, what their background was and stuff like that. Cause you know, when you're getting ready for these competitions, you're trying to figure out as much as you can. So you're checking out their, their social media and stuff like that. And some of the things these guys do, you know, for training or what their background is, it's pretty cool. And uh, uh, the language barrier is not an issue anymore with Google translate. Like it's really funny at world's, in 2018 which was in russia we were there were a bunch of us just like sitting in a, in a in a little holding pen and we all had our phones out we were talking into our phones and then like showing them like what we were saying it was it was it, like somebody if somebody would have walked by it would have been like the goofiest looking thing ever but with google translate now you all kind of just kind of talk into your phone hold the phone and it'll translate it to you and you just kind of you know communicate that way and stuff like that so it, it's a good time I, I like it a lot um it's definitely one of the coolest things i've done and, and i get to travel um, to some places I've never been to before as a result of it. So it's pretty cool. Is that like your main, is that your main athletic pursuit personally right now? Or are you doing some Olympic weightlifting still? Uh, I do. Uh, so I'm unofficially retired from weightlifting. Uh, as soon as I started coaching athletes, um, uh, coaching athletes at like national events, I stopped competing. Uh, it's just not fair to them. I've never, I've yet, and uh, people argue with me about this all the time, but I have yet to see an athlete be a very successful athlete and coach simultaneously. It's just not physically possible. Um, because at some point, you're going to either have to make a decision to be selfish or take care of your athlete. Um, and that was where it was, it, where it was getting for me. I had guys that were starting to get good enough that were competing in the same weight classes that I was in. And I was just like, it's not fair for me to get you ready for a competition and be like, all right, you're on your own. I got to go take care of me now. Um, plus, like if I'm coaching at a meet all weekend and then, because my session would always be one of the last ones. If I'm coaching all weekend at a meet and then I'm trying to sum up the energy to you know lift some heavy weights like it's just it's not going to go very well so uh, after 2016 uh, I think 2015 nationals was the last time I competed um, and uh, 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 I'm sorry 2016 nationals the last time I competed and I, and I officially like called it after that and just focus on coaching on the the weightlifting side of things but between the Highland Games uh, like I said I'm on the pro circuit and it's the best part-time job ever um, we get paid for travel. We get paid. Uh, 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 sometimes they pay us for our accommodations and then you get prize money on top of your placement and stuff like that. And I'm kind of middle of the road in the Highland games and we got some freaks in there too. Um, the big, the big thing, the big reason I still do the Highland games, I love doing the caber toss. Um, it's like my favorite thing in the whole wide. If there was just an event for that, like I'd be all about it. Um, but you gotta do all the other throwing events. And I just don't practice the other events enough because, of. uh, uh, sometimes uh, just not prioritizing it. And sometimes just I got a lot going on. So I kind of do what I can when I can. But um, it's, Highland Games is one of those, like once you're in with a few festivals, like you're kind of in until you decide you're done. And so between Highland Games and Moss Wrestling, like I feel like I have enough diversity on my plate in terms of training and stuff like that. And training for them is, is pretty similar. Um, so yeah, but, but the, the big thing we have, we were supposed to do Worlds this year. Um, for Moss Wrestling, and I was the top 275 for the U.S., um, so I was on the team and stuff like that, and I was expected to do well at 
worlds. Obviously, we didn't have it. So this upcoming year is a World Cup year, which they do three stages. And you have to kind of do well at all three stages to be crowned, you know, top three in, world, in the World Cup. And then the following year, World. So I for sure am doing two more years of Moss Wrestling just because I want to. Uh, uh, I, I took it. I went sixth and then fourth. And then I had to sit out the, the 2018 because I was opening a new gym. Felt like that was a little bit more of a bigger priority for me at the time. So I, I would just like, I'd like to get a medal uh, around my neck, just one of those competitions, and I'll, I'll be good to go after that. Can you walk us through a little bit of what training does look like for those sports, Tom? Yeah. Um, so Highland Games, a lot like training track and field, guys. Uh, it's all about horsepower. Um, so after doing it for so long, like I, like I said, I did uh, 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 – track and field. I did it uh, uh, eighth grade year and then all through high school, all through college. And then I coached at a college for two years after that. And then when I was out of Cal Strength, I coached at another high school. Um, so I've, I've been, I've, I've had been around uh, track and field a lot and I've kind of figured out what movements work the best. Um, primarily like the big, the big movers for me that I find work the best are um, hang snatches or hang muscle snatches, uh, box squats, sumo deads, uh, and push presses. Um, especially during the season, those are really the only movements that we really stress. Um, we will do like a, a banded bench press and stuff like that as more speed work, but um, I just, I'm not a huge fan of bench press for throwing overall. Um, but in our off season work, we do all of it. We'll do front squats, we'll do some cleans, we'll do back squats, uh, push press, bench press, strict press, sumo poles and all that stuff. And then obviously, you know, the, the snatches and things like that. But I think uh, hang muscle snatch is probably the most uh, beneficial movement to throwing um, just kind of carries over to every aspect of the throws so for Highland Games in particular that's probably why I'm pretty good at the caber um, because I can hang muscle snatch quite a bit um, uh, in terms of th that exercise in particular uh, comparatively speaking to like a regular power snatch or something like that so um, that's those are the main bread and butter uh, in terms of the Highland games. Um, I, I train more of like a conjugate style. So I have my max effort days. I have my dynamic effort days. And then I have my repetition days where I'll do, should do a little bit more volume accumulation. Um, and then mass wrestling, really the only thing that changes is on my lower body emphasis days, I do more pulling in the style of mass. So I have one of the rogue belt squats, which <clears throat> I know it's not how they, it's not what they made it for. Um, but like I've been able to set it up, um, um, to be able to do my moss pulling off of it. Like I just put the, I have a competition board I put in front of it. I weighed it down with some sandbags and stuff like that. Um, and I have uh, 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 my pulling rods that I'll put through a harness, attach it to the belt, lower the belt all the way down and I can get my work in there and kind of overload that starting pulling position. Cause I don't have any training partners for that. Um, so that's like my sparring, but otherwise I'm still doing my snatch work. I'm still doing clean. I'm still doing my box squats and my sumo pulls and stuff like that. But when I need like event specific work, getting ready for a competition, that's like the main thing that I do at least once a week. How, how long is a typical uh, Moss match? Uh, uh, it could be anywhere from like two seconds to like 30. Uh, there is a time cap on it. I couldn't tell you what it is because I've never reached it myself. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the bigger guys usually peter out pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, it, it usually any, anywhere from like two to 30 seconds just kind of depends on uh, how defensive somebody is. Like I used to be a little bit more of a defensive guy when I first got into it, mostly because I was just like, I had no clue what I was doing. Um, but now I've kind of, I'm a little bit more offensive in it because uh, I've worked with some people on my start and things along those lines. So um, and that's where like doing the Olympic lifts has helped me out a lot is just using that power and that explosiveness off the start, uh, to my advantage. So there's no, there's no, there's no reason to condition for that. Right. It's like, it's, it's, it's muscle endurance essentially. I will. So mass wrestling in particular, it's a best of three. So I do a lot of conditioning. A lot of my stuff is on timers, uh, every, like every minute, every two minutes, every minute, 90 or a minute, 30 seconds for my main work. I always have myself on a timer. Um, I'll do some sort of like a short little Metcon before. So like, for instance, like today I did power snatches. Uh, I did some power snatch waves um, on the minute. And before that I did an on the minute uh, wall balls, uh, 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 10 wall balls every minute on the minute for five rounds. And I didn't throw, go to like a traditional, like, you know, 20 foot target. I was just trying to get the ball up into the ceiling. 
Um, and I just did like 10 of those. And like, I'll do that for my five minutes, get warmed up, do my power snatches, do my accessories and stuff like that. And then if I have time, I'll do another short little, like whether it's Tabata or something, just a little bit, something to get the heart rate up because, um, uh, especially in like weightlifting, things like that. I've just noticed that when you have a better base of fitness, whether it's, you know, GPP or however you're doing it, I don't really care. Um, but like just having a better overall GPP base just keeps you uh, 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 less injury prone. And so that was my issue I was having is like uh, in worlds in two thousand or the world cup in 2017, I tore my hamstring uh, because I was out of shape. Uh, like I was super strong. Like I had hit some of my best lifts getting ready for that. But like you finish a match and you've got like 30 seconds to a minute or so to get back on the boards and do it all over again. And I just wasn't prepared for that. And so like the second round, I popped my hamstring because I just wasn't like conditioned for that repeated, you know, bouts on short rest and stuff like that. So after that, um, on, on top of just making sure I took better care of myself with accessories and, and stuff like that, I also started putting everything on a timer um, to make sure that I'm not just sitting around for, you know, five, six, seven minutes between sets. Because I actually, I've, I also think that's a waste of time, but personally, but, um, but yeah, for me, it was just one of those deals where it just helped carry over to all the things that I do. Because usually you're doing stuff on short rest anyways, so you might as well, you know, practice like you play. Where, where did you get your training concepts from? Like, how do you approach, do you, well, do you, do you design your own training programs, Tom? Uh, I've had a lot of people help me over the, over the years. Like I said, I work with Glenn Penley. Um, he was somebody that was huge in terms of, I'd always been a conjugate type person, like uh, Louis Simmons, Westside Barbell. The very first like structured program I ever followed was a Westside Barbell type template. Uh, the guy who was the head strength or the head athletic trainer at my college kind of noticed me in the weight room one day, asked what I was doing, what I was there for. And he kind of took me under his wing, showed me, you know, the conjugate system, taught me a little bit about the Olympic lifts and things like that. Um, and so I did them all through college and I did them more in the conjugate sense. And then when I got to uh, Cal Strength with Glenn, he was a huge help in terms of make understanding how to expand upon the system because I had only seen Westside. I had no clue that conjugate was a thing before Westside was even a, you know, that it was originally a weightlifting program. And so, excuse me, uh, Glenn did a really good job of um, explaining how they did things and how he incorporates pieces of that into what we train and stuff like that. And then after uh, I was done at MDUSA, I started working with a guy named Rudy Nielsen who ran uh, the outlaw way for a while. Um, and he was also, uh, a conjugate guy too like yeah, a lot of people didn't realize that about his training style but in terms of how he ran his strength work and how he would do like his metcons and stuff like that so I learned a lot about about how to program like the metcons in conjunction with the strength work from him and then uh, he was a big help in terms of getting ready for grid and stuff like that because he was a bit I feel like that's why I had a little bit of an advantage at the start of grid like I was able to do things like for instance I remember um, I did the, it was like the grid invitational they did for all the amateur clubs. I can't remember what year it was, but it was out in Anaheim. And I remember we got to sit and watch the final of the pros. And one of the things was like a 275 uh, for three um, um, snatch. And uh, I'm not trying to put him on blast, but I believe like Ken Baddison was the guy that they sent out there to do it. And he can only do two reps or whatever. And I always just thought that was odd because then I went like later on, like on that weekend, I went in the back and I was able to do the 275 touch and go like no problem. So it was just like, for me, uh, we did a ton of EMOM work and stuff like this. I felt like that kind of helped me out a lot where I really suffered what was like the really lightweights for high reps. Like I would peter out in that stuff. I was good for like 10 and then I'm like, here, take the barbell, like your turn um, kind of a deal. Um, but like it just, he helped me understand you know, lactic threshold and, and, and EMOMs and how to place like exercises in there and the rep schemes to use and stuff like that. So you had the right combination of work and rest and stuff like that. And then uh, after that, John Colborn helped me out. He was actually the guy who got me to do muscle ups. Um, it was, that was literally his only goal. Like he helped me with a lot of like just the general program, but he's like, I don't care if we, you know, you get drafted or not. He goes, I just want to see you do a muscle up. Uh, so he got me to be able to do a muscle up, taught me how to do handstand pushups, all that stuff. And then uh, uh, most recently, a guy named Jack Canberra, he was somebody that I worked with, and he kind of helped um, add 
to the whole conjugate thing in terms of working with all different types of athletes and stuff like that. So it's just, I, I wouldn't say, I don't have anybody specifically working with me right now. Like I write my own stuff, but I'd be lying uh, and be doing a disservice to not like include people that I've just grabbed stuff from over the years and kind of just learn from and read and talk and stuff like that. Um, uh, uh, like Travis Mash is still somebody that I talk to on a regular basis. I'll shoot him questions about training things and stuff like that because he's he's a wealth of knowledge uh, as well. So I just I try to pick and pull what I know can work for me, and then I'll try I'll experiment with stuff. And if I don't like it, I'll get rid of it. If I, if it works, I'll make a note of it and stuff like that. So I'm, I don't have anybody specifically helping me right now, but I I, I, li I like to mix and match stuff based on what the needs are for my training and, and what I'm trying to accomplish. Cool. Yeah, man. I'm just going back to those SIGL days, man. I just, I'm thinking back to you and gosh, who was your, who was the other guy? Lewis, Lewis Arnold. Lewis was with PRS and then Pat was with us. Um, we needed a third uh, yeah. the second year because we were going to, when we, anytime we'd go up against the guys, uh, um, what's his face? Paul's guys. Um, he had, he had three strong guys and uh, the first year it was just Pat and I. Yeah. And we didn't have that like third guy. We were always just getting gassed, especially in races like Echo and stuff like that. So then the third year we added Lewis and uh, it was a little bit more of a fair fight uh, once we added Lewis and stuff like that. But Lewis is another freak. He was ridiculously strong in the deadlift. Um, I remember that. I remember the, one of the like training camps that we did, like watching him do deadlifts. I was like, this, you're, this is pretty impressive. Uh, Lewis is a good dude. Uh, he actually, I think he got drafted by LA. Yeah, he did. Yep. Uh, that that team that we had on PRS was pretty cool. Like I think we had like six or seven people to get drafted or signed um, that year uh, for the grid league, which was pretty cool to be on. I mean, didn't do us a whole lot of good because I think we you know, like half of them showed up to our first round of the playoffs and we got bounced uh, in the first round by a team that hadn't won a match in two years. But uh, I mean, I'm not sour about that at all. <laughs> well, I mean, you're not you're you're not going to win a race when you have me. Krista Owens and Lewis Arnold uh, doing parts of Jack and Jill. Like, it's just, you, you, if you think you're going to win, Jack and Jill was like a heavily gymnastics. Um, luckily, it was handstand push ups. So we knew how to do all of those. And we could do, like, I, I was only, me and uh, Jess Roper were the only ones that knew how to do the deficits or could do multiple reps of the deficit handstand push up and stuff like that. But like when you've got three of your barbell specialists out on the course doing a handstand or uh, an inverted uh, heavy race, like your chances of winning the whole thing are going to be slim to that. And the other team knew it too. As soon as that race came out, like they threw their little bonus flag and I'm like, well, there goes this one. Like, so Tom, I found it like really interesting. Uh, something you said earlier about you started a CrossFit gym because you thought you needed to do that to have Olympic weightlifting clients and coach Olympic yeah. weightlifting. Um, two questions. Like, yeah. what do you think the sport of CrossFit did for other strength sports? And then why did you realize you didn't need that anymore to coach weightlifting? I think CrossFit did a great job of exp like. CrossFit has its faults. Like there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Every training methodology or fitness thing has their faults in one way or another. What CrossFit did a phenomenal job of doing, and, and anybody that wants to deny this, like they're just straight up delusional. They put more barbells in the general population's hands than any sort of training modality ever could imagine. You had um, in, a, in, a, in a typical CrossFit class, you had some, you had uh, uh, somebody's mom, you know, who, you know, she, she'd never done a, an athletic sport in her life. You had an old college baseball player. You had uh, somebody's grandpa and you have a 15 year old kid, you know, spread out in this class, all learning how to do a barbell snatch. Um, there was just no other fitness thing that was bringing the people together like that and putting them through the same type of ringer. Um, so I feel like, I feel like every strength sport has benefited tremendously from strongman or uh, from uh, CrossFit strongman in particular, like before CrossFit strongman had two weight divisions. You had 105 and under 105 and up like that was it. Now I believe strongman has, you know, four or five different weight divisions. And that's because, you know, up until, up until people started joining boxes, they never saw a yoke 
They never saw a sandbag. They never saw farmer's handles or an axle or anything like that, or even an Atlas stone. Like I know uh, Rob Orlando, you know, he's really big with the Atlas stones and stuff like that. And I guarantee you before people joined his gym or knew who he was, they had no clue what an Atlas stone was. Um, weightlifting was another thing like USAW owes a lot of their success financially and internationally to CrossFit putting barbells in people's hands. Um, like Morgan King, she's a 2016 Olympian. She found weightlifting through CrossFit, you know? And so it's just one of those deals where CrossFit did a great job of putting barbells in people's hands that otherwise would never have had exposure to it. Now there are some drawbacks in terms of, you know, those people coming over because like, for instance, what it was, what was happening to me, like to answer your second question is when I opened up the CrossFit, um, I had a weightlifting team and a club that was training outside and it's not a knock on anybody that does this, but I was very adamant that there was a difference between a barbell club and a weightlifting team. Um, a barbell club was a group of like, it was like a one time a week thing, two times a week thing. People were doing just barbell specific, no conditioning. It could be benching, squatting, deadlifting, uh, snatch, clean and jerk, et cetera. Then I had my weightlifting team, which were people that were specifically competing in the sport of weightlifting. And the problem I was starting to run into while it was giving people were being exposed to the Olympic lifts and be like, oh man, there is just a sport where all I have to do are these two things. Like I'm in, sign me up. But then I started having people who, if they didn't like the wad on that day, they would come over and be like, oh, can I try weightlifting today? And I, me being all naive, naive and everything, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And I would, you know, work them through and, and you know, help them out. And then the next day, I'm like, oh, you're going to do weightlifting today? Like, no, nah, I'm going to do the wad. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so that was happening more and more and more. And then um, because CrossFit had created sort of a feeder system for weightlifting for so long, um, so I'm talking like around 2012, to 2015. I feel like that was the real big boom in terms of barbell movements, and so especially in CrossFit. Like you were seeing, you know, max overhead squats, max snatches, um, snatch ladders, clean ladders, stuff like that at the games, at regionals, that people started noticing the sport. And before all that, um, the thought of a weightlifting centric facility would never survive. Anytime you ever talked about like, I'm going to open a weightlifting gym, like, okay, well, what else are you going to do? Because that's not going to pay the bills. And then after that 2012, to 2015 boom, it was a thing. And so I got into it around 2016 at the tail end of that boom, um, uh, so to speak. And I was just like, yeah, I, I, I don't know if the weightlifting thing is going to survive. So I want to keep my hand, you know, on both pulses and just kind of work with both and kind of help um, 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 nurture the two together sort of a deal. And after a year in, it just continued on the weightlifting side of things. It just continued to escalate. Like we had, you know, we started, I mean, they started cracking down on performance enhancers in the sport of weightlifting, but on the flips or on the international stage, they started cracking down on it. But weightlifting on the US level, we were starting to compete better internationally. We were starting to get better quality athletes. We were starting to get better quality coaching. We had revamped our coaching course to keep up with, you know, CrossFit and their level one, level two, level three, and all their specialty courses and stuff like that. And so it just, this sport continued to grow and kind of veer off its own path and it wasn't feasible anymore to be focusing on both and quite honestly I'm a weightlifting guy that was where I was gonna if I had to pick between the two I was always gonna pick weightlifting over CrossFit and stuff like that so you know I just I had a very you know frank conversation with my business partner and just said hey like I want to focus on weightlifting I want to focus on sports performance and um, I just don't think the CrossFit thing is for me. And so it was, it was an amicable split. Like, and I took my weightlifters, I took my sports performance because that was the other thing too, is I started having kids that were like, well, I want to do what they're doing, but I play basketball and I, or I play football or something like that. So those programs were starting to grow. And in the space we were in, there wasn't enough room for all three programs to grow and flourish. Like I wanted them to. Um, so I just took the two programs and just did my own thing. And I, I don't regret that decision because 
most people automatically assume that because I have sports performance that that's what pays the bills. And it does to an extent, but like if the sports performance program went away, my weightlifting program is like the main like lifeline of the gym and stuff like that. And so it just kind of showed me that it got to a point where I can solely focus on this and it could be a career if I wanted it to be. Um, so it's just, it, that, that was pretty much how I came to that decision. What, what's the name of, what's the name of that program, your gym and how does oh. it operate on a daily basis? I mean, it'd help if I actually gave that information out at some point, wouldn't it? Um, so uh, I started the Strength Agenda 100% as an online platform in 2013. I was just putting out like recipes uh, 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 for people who train in the strength sports and stuff like that. And then I started putting out training articles and interviews and stuff like that. And then I started remote coaching. Um, essentially what was happening was I was going around with Glenn and helping him with his coaching seminars and people would talk to me and work with me and they're like, hey, would you mind like writing programs or training for me? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And then I started getting into coaching weightlifting classes at CrossFits and stuff like that. And people were like, can you write some more stuff for me to do outside of this one time a week class? So I started uh, building an online crew um, and I had about 20 athletes or so when I started the CrossFit that I was just working with online. And then, um, and so we had, we had our, the, the CrossFit had their own weightlifting team. And then I started team saw, which uh, was a, was short for strength agenda weightlifting. Um, and so I had my online lifters, which weren't affiliated with the CrossFit. And then I had a lot of my in uh, person lifters. So I, I had about four or five people that kind of signed on right away. And then it kind of grew to 10. So then um, when I did, when I took, did the split and went and did my own thing, I had like 12 weightlifters um, that were in-house 14 or I'm sorry, 12 weightlifters, four sports performance kids. And then I had like 20 or 30 um, remote athletes that were spread out all over the place, like Texas, California, uh, Oregon, New York, South Carolina, um, just all over the place. And then as we've been kind of growing, like, so I started out with remote coaching. And when I started doing it, it was not a big thing. A lot of people actually were trying to convince me not to do it. Cause they're just like, Hey, like, I don't think you're going to make a ton of money doing this. Like, I don't know how you think you're going to be able to coach people via remote and stuff like that. Um, but it worked out and it actually is like the, that is the, the, the bulk of my business. I would say probably about 60% of my athletes now that I go, cause I have over just weightlifting alone. We have over 80 athletes that we work with. Um, and then I also have power lifters, uh, some power lifters, uh, strongman competitors, and a lot of Highland games guys and college throwers that I work with as well. Um, but I would say overall, especially on the weightlifting side, I'd say about 60 to 70% of my business weightlifting wise is remote. Um, and like I, I and, and with technology and stuff like that, it just makes it a lot easier. So, um, like I said, I teach during the day. So the gym's closed during the day and, you know, out, outside of COVID, um, we have, we're open four to 8 PM. So the weightlifters can have, everybody has their workouts. We have an app that everybody's on. Uh, based on where you're at in terms of your your needs and things like that, you have your program that gets sent out to you at the beginning of the week, whether it's three, four, or five days a week. You come into the gym, you have your workout, you start doing your warm up, and you just and I'm on the floor kind of coaching people and stuff like that. And then we have our sports performance classes running, so it's not really like class times, but it's more like an open gym format. Now, obviously, with COVID, like we you know, we have two hour blocks that you have to reserve your slot and everything like that, but it's still the same. People come in. They do their warm up. They have their app on the phone. They ask me questions if they need it, and I'm kind of giving them feedback and stuff along those lines. And then my remote people, they still have the same programs that they get. And what they do is the app that we use. It's called Gym Journal. Um, they can just upload their videos right to the workout. It's kind of like a Facebook page. So they'll log their workout in there, add the videos to it. And then me and I have a, a staff of coaches that help me out with it. We go through throughout the week and kind of give feedback on their lifts and stuff like that, just focusing on little things here and there. And then, you know, once a year we sit down and we set up goal setting meetings, making sure that we have a plan of attack for their entire calendar year. And we'll touch base with them and stuff like that. And they have access to me pretty much 24 seven. Like we have a WhatsApp string. Uh, for all the lifters, uh, we have separate ones for the different groups. We have different Facebook pages and stuff like that. Just trying to create as many channels as possible for them to all communicate and kind of uh, uh, ask questions and things like that and just kind of interact with each other. Because sometimes we'll go to meets and they'll be like, oh, who's that? And I'm like, oh, well, they're on the team and they didn't know or anything like that. So I try to eliminate that as much as possible. But it's it's, it's been fun. 
Uh, we've been, like I said, we've been, it's, the, the weightlifting team in particular has been around since 2014. Um, uh, we've sent, you know, over a hundred different athletes to senior, uh, to, to, uh, 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 USAW like national events between the senior nationals, American open final and stuff like that. Our women's masters team, um, is awesome. Uh, masters weightlifting was something I had, I wouldn't say I had no intention on getting into it. It just kind of happened that I had people coming to me and I, 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 figured out pretty quickly how to program for them. So like our women's team, you know, um, um, they do really well at nationals every year. We have a couple of them that have competed at the world level and stuff like that. So the weightlifting side of things, just, it's a, it's a mixed bag of stuff. And I, I, I enjoy it a lot. Like it's really something I get a lot of uh, um, fulfillment out of and stuff like that. Cause it kind of helps me make that connection from like the high school kids that I work with on a daily basis to you know, adults and post-collegiate uh, athletes and stuff like that as well. And then now on top of that, I teach the USAW level one courses in the Chicagoland area. So it kind of came all full circle. So I kind of hit it all um, on different heads. Like I have no intentions on getting international athletes. Um, if I do, that's great. But I really enjoy the developmental side of it and, and taking an athlete from like barely being able to do an overhead squat to qualifying for, you know, the American Open final or something like that. So you have, it's you and, and, uh, and your coaching staff. How are you guys organizing? Like, are all of your athletes getting their own training? Or are they following like a template based on where they're at in the year? How does that work? Originally, what we were doing is, so I write all the programming. Um, originally, what we were doing is we had two main tracks. Like, everything kind of uh, branches off of the main track, which was our weightlifting stuff. Um, but we had, like I said, because we had a master's group that started to kind of develop, uh, they had their own track of programming. Um, so we had our master's program. Um, and then like over the years, it's evolved to, we have a whole bunch of varieties. We have something where I call MED, which is minimal effective dose for like our people who are just, you know, have like, we have a couple of people on the team with kids and, you know, work uh, and family obligations and stuff like that. So they can't devote more than, you know, 60, 90 minutes to training. So we take, you know, I, I break the programming down to them and say like, okay, this is your biggest bang for your buck that you're going to do this day. So we have that track. We have another thing that we call the pump agenda. Um, essentially what was happening was um, I was doing a lot of research and finding out that like women were very susceptible to elbow, uh, uh, elbow and wrist injuries and weightlifting just based on their, you know, genetics and things along those lines. So I had a girl who I had her test out this upper body specific accessory program that went in conjunction with her weightlifting. Um, and like over the summer, everybody just kept talking about how jacked her shoulders and her traps were and stuff like that. And so she started calling it the pump agenda. It started out as a joke, but now like everybody refers to this program as the pump agenda. So then we had that track where it was, you know, it was your weightlifting plus a little more upper body centric in terms of accessory work. Uh, it started out as injury prevention, but now some of the guys like it for obvious reasons. Um, and stuff like that. And then we had people that were coming over to CrossFit that just couldn't quit the fitness. And I don't make anybody do anything. I just try to have to sit them down and be like, okay, are your goals to get better at weightlifting or are your goals to just get stronger at the lifts while doing your fitness? I was like, cause those are two different, you know, avenues here. So for the people who just want to get stronger in the snatch and clean and jerk, but still do their fitness, I write conditioning workouts for them, um, that could, that, that fit because otherwise, you know, I've, I've had athletes get hurt because they would do like my full on weightlifting workout and then go to another gym and go do like the Metcon for the day. And then they're like, well, my shoulder really hurts. And it's like, well, yes, after doing snatch waves, when you decide to do, you know, 200 butterfly pull ups, like that's going to happen. So it's just an easier way for me to track tonnage and stuff like that. So we don't have any specific, I don't do any individualized stuff. But we have different, we had different tracks based on where the athlete was when they first joined, where I thought was best for them. Sometimes if they're just not ready for the Olympic lifts or they're not sure, like I have just a basic strength templates that we put them on that focus on, you know, squatting, pressing, pulling, stuff like that. Um, and then, like I said, we have our powerlifting strongman stuff and things like that. So we, we have a variety of different programs. I think last time I had counted, it's something like uh, uh, like 22 different programs or whatever that you, the athletes got to pick from based on what their goals were and stuff like that. And now that the team has gotten so big, we've transitioned even more into tiers of programming. So we have like our gold 
We have gold, silver, bronze, essentially gold is for all my athletes who compete at senior nationals and American open final on a regular basis. So that is their, they, they all have that program with obviously their little nuances based on what they need and things along those lines. But the two main meets that we're focusing on is getting them ready for, you know, those two meets. So everything builds up to senior nationals, which is now in July. And then everything builds up to AO finals, which is in December. And then our silver level is for those people who are on the cusp of qualifying for those events, but they're still just kind of learning the ropes of competing. So we kind of based on that's a little more open ended. So based on what their their meets of focus are, um, like their program builds them up to the meet of focus that we establish at the very beginning of the year. And then we have our bronze level program, which anybody who's only been with me under two years is on that. And we're still focusing on basics. We're still focusing on technique refinement, but you're still also going to get stronger and we can get you ready for meets if we feel like, if, if you feel like you're ready to do a meet, but I don't push people to do meets. I don't push people to cut weight or anything like that. I kind of use a guided discovery approach with that. Like, like they'll be like, Oh, what are they doing? And I'll explain it to them. And they're like, Oh, maybe we should try that. And I'm like, yeah, if you want, we can. Um, because I don't want anybody walking away from weightlifting with a bad taste in their mouth. Like the last thing you want to do is go to a meet and either bomb out or go two for six or one for six or something like that. And, and that, that, that's just not helping anybody, uh, myself included. So I want to make sure that people are getting out of it, what they are or what they, what they came to me for. But I also want to make sure that they're realistic in their expectations. Like I, I literally just had somebody that I had to say, you know, I just don't think this is a good fit for you because he's like, well, I want to come in here and do weightlifting on these days, but I have to get ready for the open. And I'm like, I just, I don't know. I said, I, you're going to hurt yourself. Um, Cause I've seen it happen a million times uh, over uh, athletes. Try, like uh, I had an athlete trying to do, uh, prep for masters nationals during the open and they were doing the open workouts and stuff like that. And I'm not going to say that this caused her shoulder issues, but it definitely didn't help her shoulder issues that she was already having. So it's just one of those deals where I'm very um, upfront with people about where they think they want to go. And I'm, I'm realistic and explain to them, you know, the ins and outs because I've been where they are both as a competitive athlete in weightlifting and doing the grid stuff. And I'm like, look, like you got to pick. So we have a variety of programming options for people, but I also try to stay in my lane. Like I am not a CrossFit coach. I'm never qualifying for regionals or the, 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 the sanctionals or the games or anything like that. So I'm not going to pretend to know like that. I know how to program for that kind of stuff. Like I help people out with the knowledge that I have, but I'm also a hundred percent upfront with that. My, my thing is getting people stronger and, making sure that they maintain a basic level of fitness so that they can, you know, play with their kids and walk up a flight of stairs without having to stop and catch their breath or anything like that. Tom, can you talk to us a little bit about what you are doing in schools that is a strength and conditioning coach? The, so the CPS uh, uh, is starting to kind of take a, an approach to what they call like just like their extras or their extracurricular classes. And so my school in particular is a performing arts school. And they decided for their PE program that they're going to add a couple of extracurricular. So we added a walking class, which is actually a really, I wish I had that in high school because this class for 90 minutes literally goes on hikes around the city. Um, they go up to like, they go off, yeah, they go off Lakeshore Drive up to, up to, up to, up around Lake Michigan. They see all the buildings and stuff. Like they literally hike around the city for 90 minutes. And I wish I would have, like they walk like four or five miles a day um, while one we're in school. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty cool class. They added uh, uh, two different types of dance, rhythmic and like a, 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 a ballet, um, which the rhythmic is more like, or is more like a hip hop class, which is kind of cool because they, they're, they're across the hall from me. So I can always hear whatever music they're playing and what they're doing and stuff like that. And then mine, which was strength and conditioning. So because we are in the CPS, we are kind of landlocked. The kids have to travel for our facility. So instead of making them come back and do their strength and conditioning stuff after school hours, they've included it in their PE uh, 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 curriculum. So I'm technically a PE teacher, but I'm the strength coach at the school. So the kids come to me and we have their like normal workouts like they would do in a regular strength and conditioning situation. Um, they come in, uh, I take attendance, they get their warmups in, we do our movement prep, they do our main lifting, we do our conditioning work and you know they're, they're, they're on with their day. Um, I only see the kids two to three times a week because we're on A-B schedules. So it just depends on where they're at. Um, and I start with like a linear periodized model with them. Just, you know, basic five by five, six by three, seven by two building and main movements. 
Um, and then towards the end of the year, I was going to transition and teaching them about the conjugate method and stuff like that. So with remote learning, we've been, we've been remote the entire year out here in Illinois. Um, and so with that, I took the opportunity to kind of educate them because it was something I always wanted to do. It's what I do with my interns that I get at the gym because I was noticing like a lot of these colleges don't explain like the backstory behind strength and conditioning or how certain things came to be and why they are the way they are. So I took the opportunity to do that with my high school kids too. So this year we started off the first half or the first quarter. I just taught them the history of strength and conditioning. We talked about, you know, the ancient Greeks and the Persians and the Chinese and how they use fitness to train their militaries and how the fitness standards came to be currently. We talked about the very uh, beginning of the Olympics. Um, we talked about how strongman, weightlifting, powerlifting all became things. Um, and then Rogue put out a bunch of really great documentaries on like legends of like strength and stuff like that. So we kind of, we talked about all those things. Um, and then I went into a program design thing with the kids where I literally am teaching them how to write their own training program. So we started at the very basics where I explained, you know, um, I, I, I explained to them, you know, progressive overload, talked about Milo and the bull as an example of that. Um, talked about linear periodization, talked about, you know, the conjugate method. Um, we talked about, you know, uh, uh, upper body. We created, we created exercise libraries for upper, lower, and core. Talked about flexion, extension, posterior, anterior chain work, dynamic, static work. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's just, it's been really fun to teach them about that. Like uh, the last thing we did before Christmas break was we talked about how to structure out a daily workout, how to give percentages based on, you know, data that I've seen over the years you know, based on where a percentage of your work should be based on your, your warm up, your, uh, uh, your movement prep, your main lifts, your accessories, your conditioning and all that stuff. Um, you know, we talked about the different energy systems. A lot of these kids didn't know about, you know, all the different energy systems that, you know, we use in a training session. Uh, we talked about, you know, uh, different ways to train muscle fiber types between endurance, strength, and power and stuff like that. Talk to them about speed strength, strength, speed, and like the kids are really liking it. Like we've, I've actually had a few kids reach out to me asking, you know, if this was a college thing because they didn't know that you can go to school and study to be a strength coach. So it's been really cool for me to, to, to kind of share that information with these kids because, um, I feel like that's a huge thing that is lacking today, especially in the social media world. You see somebody do something, but they don't explain how they got there or why they're doing it. Or they, or if they do explain it, it is some half, you know what, backwards explanation. And you're like, that's, that's not accurate at all. And you're going to get somebody hurt. So I kind of do, you know, took it upon myself with these kids, just make sure that they had all the facts, they had all the information needed and stuff like that. And, and, and it's kind of funny. One of the kids actually said that like, he's had discussions with a personal trainer at a gym that he works out at about like some of the things that he says that are not accurate and stuff. So like, that's not my intention is for them to go out and start arguments with people. But um, it's kind of cool to see these kids gravitating towards that and really enjoying learning about stuff. And then hopefully, you know, in the second half of the school year, we'll be back at school and they can apply all this stuff because the, the, the whole quarter is going to end we have like, we'll have like three weeks left of the quarter when we get back to school and their, their final project is going to be, they have to write me a four week program for any sport or goal that they want. Like I, I gave them a goal setting sheet. And so we spent a whole day how to uh, create goals using smart goals and they're going to have to create a goal for themselves. And then they have to write a four week program to reflect that goal. Like that's the, that's the culminating thing for these first two quarters of remote learning. And then hopefully, like I said, by that time we're back in the weight room and they can take all that knowledge and really understand why we're doing what we're doing. Cause that was the missing piece last year was the kids had loved the workouts. It was cool to see kids add, you know, 50 pounds to their squat and stuff like that, that had never done a back squat before, but they didn't really understand why we were doing what we were doing. So um, now my, my, I wouldn't say problem, but uh, the challenge is, is, is finding a way to incorporate this educational stuff with the physical stuff and not take uh, uh, too much away from the, the physical time we get to work with each other in the classroom next year because we, I, only, I do only get to see them a few days a week. Oh, Tom, I will say, I would have loved to have taken your class uh, in high school. I think it yeah. kind of inspired me to like take the plunge to be a fitness coach a little sooner and like not yeah. just nervous about that stuff. Yeah. You might be inspiring uh, the next generation. Of I, hope so. I hope so. I mean, that was pretty much how I got started. Like my, in, when I was in high school, I had my, my football coach, he was my offensive line coach, but he taught a weightlifting class. 
and it was only a 75 minute class, but like you could, you could opt out of PE and take his class instead. And that was kind of how he ran it. Like he didn't give us as much of the educational stuff, but like he taught us how to lift. He wouldn't let us get away with poor form and stuff like that. And he himself was always in the, in the weight room. You'd see him as you're walking to class. Like he was in there, you know, six thirty, seven 7 o'clock before school was starting in there working out himself. And it just kind of instilled that whole, like, yeah, I want to do that. Like, that's pretty cool and stuff like that. And it got to the point, like by my senior year, you know, senior year, it's like kind of a blow off and you can take as many like a uh, blow off classes as you want. I had two weightlifting classes and then I aided for him during my lunch period because I just, I liked being around that atmosphere and that environment so much. And that was definitely a huge, like from that point on, I was like, I want to be a teacher and a coach. Um, and eventually I'm going to open my own gym. Like it was like from that point on, I like, I knew what I wanted to do. And it was, if I didn't have that, you know, experience with him, who knows what I'd be doing right now. So that's, that's definitely a little bit of the goal going through this. It's just hoping that like, I have a kid um, who is going to be a senior, not this upcoming year, but next year in college. And he's, I taught when I had him as a PE student at my old grade school. And he actually reached out to me asking if I'd be, uh, if I, if he could intern with me. So like uh, next year for his senior year, and that's going to be insane to have a kid that I taught as like a, a grade school, you know, uh, fifth grade PE to now he's, he's getting ready to be a strength coach himself. And he wants to intern with me before he goes out there into the real world. So like that, that's just, that's some really cool stuff uh, that, that, that kind of makes me excited. And it makes me want to continue doing what I'm doing. Stay with us for more Backroom Talk. Well, uh, I uh, learned a new thing today, uh, which was, all about moss wrestling. Moss wrestling, yeah. I want to give that a try. I think we should go out there in the gym and like hook it up and, and see what happens. I thought of the first time I tried wake surfing, my feet pressed against that board <laughs> and that handle in my hand, and how many times I just got ripped off that board <laughs> and couldn't stand up. So I'm pretty sure that's exactly what's gonna happen. That's one of those sports where in my brain, I'm, I'm like, oh, I'd probably be the best in the world at that thing. And then I like, face a dude like Tom and he literally just slings me 20 <laughs> meters behind like him. Like a ragdoll flying across the room. No, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a good conversation with Tom. He's such a good dude. He has a lot of, lot of different experiences mm -hmm. in fitness from, uh, you know, track and field to weightlifting, strongman, Highland Games, grid, CrossFit. What am I missing? Powerlifting. Uh, yeah. And he's worked with with some some of the greatest coaches, right? Like of our time, right? Glenn Penlay. Um, he didn't mention Don McCullough, but he he worked with him as well at Muscle Driver and uh, Travis Mash and those guys. So he has a has a lot of uh, has a lot of knowledge and has a lot of really really cool experiences. Yeah, those. I mean, those kids. Uh, shame they can't be in the weight room right now. But I would have loved to have been a part of that class. I know I mentioned that. I'd take the walking class over the strength conditioning class. Actually, that sounds really cool. Walking class sounds so 90 relaxing. minutes, just go out and hike. It's like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wander around the city, grab a coffee on the way. Sounds yeah. great. Now, my, my biggest takeaway from that conversation with Tom was um, sometimes you just got to grind. And he didn't mention it at all, but I, I know him personally. Um, and he's just a grinder. Mm -hmm. That dude just does things. And he pushes things and does them until someone tells him like, hey, you, you got to stop doing this. This isn't going to work for you. And he did that on the athlete side, right, where he went all in on that grid thing where not a lot of people know this, but I founded that league, that SAGL league, and we were a direct farm system to the NPGL. And we kind of did that on accident. And Tom was like the poster child of that league. And he was the reason why we put that thing together because we're like, there's this really cool concept which if it was executed properly, like that, that thing would be massive right now, right? And, you know, we would have been a part of that as OPEX owning, owning uh, the Phoenix Rise, but there was no way into it. So Tom was the poster child and why we started that. And he executed that thing beautifully. Crowds loved him. Like we would have full gyms, like our gym was really large, but we had like hundreds of people stacked in stands watching this thing. And everyone just loved Tom because he was an unbelievable athlete this guy would just go and touch and go clean and jerk 315 to win matches touch and go uh 300 pounds in the snatch to win matches and everyone was just crowd was on their feet for that guy but he's uh he's a grinder a hard worker and he was that as an athlete and now he's that as a coach that's really cool to see